Three, two, and go on one. I think we're live now. Yep, we're live. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, uh, today's a really big day. We're pretty excited. The Cosmos Hub 4, uh, the Stargate um, the Stargate mainnet just launched. And there's a, there's a lot of excitement. We're making blocks. And, and this is the white paper has been delivered. So that's really exciting. And, uh, and even more. So, um, you know, we've got Dean and Roland here from Agoric. And uh, you guys were a big part of making it more than just what the white paper had promised, I think, right? We were a big part of the IBC piece. That was our that was our biggest contribution. The rest were cheerleaders, right? <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm I'm Gavin um, from Figment and Clay. So you're from hey. Figment. How's it going? I'm Dean. I'm Roland. Um, Clay, I don't know if you you want to give a few words. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I um so. Yes, I like this is a big day, you know, uh, the white paper has been delivered. Um, but it, this, this conversation is mostly about Agoric um, and about how Agoric is planning to be the, the smart contract platform to accelerate DeFi. And, and I know, Dean, uh, you and uh, I believe Mark have I've been in this space for a super long time, uh, longer than I've been alive. <laughs> so <laughs> I know that you kind of uh, go over this uh, a lot in your um, talks with other folks, but it, I think it would just make sense if, for people who aren't fully um, aware of the Agoric project to, to give like a, a brief, brief uh, overview of like the history of smart contracts, just to kind of set the foundation for the use case of Agoric. Sure. So we are doing a, you know, Cosmos SDK tenement based uh, layer one chain. Uh, coming out later this year for doing smart contracts accessible to a lot more programmers, accessible, implementable in uh, a secure version of JavaScript, so that that you know the millions of programmers out there that would do smart contracts if only they could um, are, are now able to do so. I worked on the first production smart contract back in 1989, so this is before blockchain. And for us, you know, so smart contracts are really about um, software enforcing the terms of a contract-like arrangement between third parties. And so it predates blockchain by a lot. Um, you know, there, there, and, and, and there are lots of examples in the world from before blockchain. So eBay, PayPal, Venmo, you know, Airbnb, much of the negotiation, Uber, Lyft, a bunch of Amazon, <clears throat> high-frequency trading, a lot of those, no human was involved in two third parties collaborating or, 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 or cooperating in some way, even though often they have no, they don't know each other, they'll never meet each other, they might not even like each other, and yet they successfully cooperate. Um, and then blockchain brings uh, um, integrity to the platform. The, the problem with smart contracts pre-blockchain is there's there, there'd be someone running a trusted third party in the middle. So, you know, they're, they're standing there, whether it's Airbnb or StubHub or whoever, ready to scrape off 35% of the profits um, in order for two people that have otherwise nothing to do with them to actually be able to cooperate. And that means they're the they're controlling the entire arrangement. They're a lot, they're enabling what features you can do. They're, they've got control of custody, all those kinds of things. And what blockchain brings, my, my gold standard for blockchain um, uh, is multiple machines, validators, um, in different jurisdictions and different administrative domains, you know, voting to agree on facts, how much was my, how much money is in my account, uh, choices, did I cancel my order before you shipped it or did you ship it before I canceled my order? And those have to happen in an order um, or, you know, in, in some sequence. And all of these hundreds of machines across the, uh, across the globe decide and agree on whether my cancel happened first or whether the shipping happened first. And then finally, the result of computation, right? You know, did the right amount of fees or taxes or whatever get taken out and get sent to the right amount to, to, to the right parties? And go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say. So we have a we have a marketplace um, that's that's controlled or enforced algorithmically, and if there needs to be any sort of intervention, that comes from a, uh, you know a distributed set of parties that are disinterested, at least in the specific exactly. arrangement. They're more interested in preserving the whole of the market, I guess. In this case, yes, exactly, exactly. And also importantly, it's permissionless. You know, that's pretty crucial to actually be. You know, be. 
a big part of what makes it so you can remove the trusted third party in the middle is that the system is permissionless. The system is is um, uh, uh, disinterested in your particulars, as you say, right? You know, that, 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 that their incentive is to make sure things operate correctly so that you can make arrangements with, with, with people you want to do business with or cooperate with um, and have the system enforce those terms. Yep. And if that arrangement you don't like, you can implement your own, you can deploy your own, and you could have a different deal with, with, with somebody else. So, so we've, we've seen like historically, like this kind of build it and they'll come narrative. Um, and we've mm. seen a bit of it around Ethereum where, you know, they built this kind of really rough thing. And then all of a sudden uh, there's this, this explosion of development. Um, and so, Others uh, step up and say, "Oh, well, we can we can do better than this, right?" And then they build stuff, and now it seems like most of what they're building—maybe it's too soon to say this—but most of what they're building is just bridges to Ethereum uh -huh. um, instead of actually like building their community within. So, wh what's going on here? And, and right, well, I... you may be surprised to know that I know some libertarians. Um, <laughs> no. um, and there was always this, you know, there, there was, you know, a naive sense of, you know, uh, build it and they will come, right? You know, the marketplace will provide any number of these things. And my response to the market will provide is, no, 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 no. The market is a place where you can provide, right? You know, innovation happens. It's not that the market does anything for me. What the market enables is for third parties to permissionlessly come in and do something for me, you know, that I find valuable. And, and, and. And so we are we are both building a place where people can permissionlessly permissionlessly come in and do their thing, but we're also doing some things there that are actually interesting and valuable to people, right? So you're building so, a market. You're actually you're, market, building, right. you're building a platform for a mark for marketplaces, but you're also actually building marketplaces. That's right. Yeah. We originally were expecting to just do a platform. This is when we were first getting into it and we knew that solving security was hard, making it so you could do pluggable development and build on each other's work is hard. Um, but but it, we were you know into doing that and thinking about how does all this happen when we realized that no, 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 you know, Ethereum is working right now because it is a place that multiple people go, right? You know, if, if you had staking derivatives magically inside of Cosmos Hub, it would do you very little good, well, before yesterday, it would do you very little good because now you've got this thing and nobody, you know, and you can't sell it to anyone. Or you've got this thing and you can't make something that wraps it up or buy insurance about it or or use it to power a loan in some other service. You need an ecosystem of multiple businesses cooperating in order for any of those businesses to take off. So it's not just, you know, the the, the network effect of a chain, you need the network effect of an economy. And, and it is the case that that, again, until, Yesterday, that was pretty much only available on on um, on Ethereum, right? They had an, they you know built it and a few people trickled in. You know <laughs> they didn't come in masses, but a few people trickled in. But it sort of got enough that they were there and they could work with each other. And people got excited about the realization they could do transactions that talk to multiple businesses. With IBC launch, and by the way, I am totally honored. And I don't know if there's an accident. I'm totally honored that we end up here on 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 Stargate Day, right? You know. Um, but with with IBC launch, without yes, without wait, wait, okay, he's gonna show off logos. Now. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, that's different. I've got a different um, one sweatshirt. Uh, uh, with IBC launch, now suddenly, you know, I, I was thinking about this the other day when I was when I was getting ready for this and when I was getting ready for the talk last night, that suddenly we go from all these little islands of blockchain, right, to you know, not just a little bit of connection, because the hub always talked about, you know, we could connect to your zone and everyone would think about it of, okay, so my zone could connect to the hub. What do I do with that? Okay, there's assets over there. Maybe that's interesting. But no, 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 no. It's with IBC, forget the hub. Now any chain could connect to any chain, you know, and, and that means that two chains that I have no idea about could end up being the center of some very important universe to people that I've never met, right? And the hub means that now it's easy for chains to connect to each other, you know, in the star pattern. And there's lots of reasons for that. But the nice thing is I don't need their permission. You know, I can connect to Sommelier. I can connect to Peggy. I can connect to Enigma. I can connect to all these things with nobody getting to interrupt and interfere with that, um, uh, 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 you know, as long as the two parties agree. And but this, this wasn't possible before Dynamic IBC, right? Like this is this this is what you've worked on, right? Well, so, so, so dynamic IBC for, for people, right? When we first did IBC, you know, it's like, okay, two chains on either side can make an agreement and now they can connect. 
But, you know, IBC is layered. That's sort of great. Now TCP works, but there's a protocol above that. And they also need to deploy code on either side to talk that protocol. So everyone gets transfer for free. We included that application protocol in the shipping IBC 1.0. But that's, that's just, you know, the baby lowest, <coughs> simplest possible important thing you could do with IBC. If you want to move, you know, uh, proof of location or, you know, proof of credentials or um, some meeting arrangement or secret keys for doing, um, for, for doing private messaging. That's a new protocol. You deploy it on one side and now it's your brand new protocol and there's nobody talking to it. So DIBC, dynamic IBC, was just the realization that if we wanted the rapid innovation, you know, the, the, the big thing that loose coupling does is it means two parties can make any arrangement they want and they're good. We don't need a global agreement on a protocol after that low level, you know, after the low level IBC. And that's hugely important for unleashing innovation. But it's even better if you don't need to agree with anyone. If you can just, I'm going to build my thing. I'm going to build the counterparty contract that can run on your chain. And now all you need to decide is, yes, I'll take it. You don't have to implement a bunch of logic, you know, there. And, and it's even better if a few people on your chain can say, yes, I'll take it, right? And it's not that everyone has to agree. You don't need a governance vote. You don't need to wait two months to turn it on. It's just, hmm, I want some of that. I'll go ahead and, you know, you know, uh, get it deployed onto my chain so I can talk that proof of location protocol. And then two applications on, on the Agora chain can do proof of location and the other guys have an opt-in in, that's fine. So right. this is what scared me about, like as a as a Cosmos hub stakeholder, this is kind of what scared me in the early days was I realized, I'm not early days, this was this wasn't this wasn't too many months ago that <laughs> I was I was kind of like, well, why would anybody why would anyone connect to the hub to for what the reason that the hub exists for as as a means of of moving uh, value and data throughout the cosmos ecosystem that's what the hub's vying to be there's no as far as we know there's really no other purpose for the for the hub and it doesn't need to exist for the ecosystem to exist well i was i said oh agoric's ready to do this with like you have to if, if the hub was going to do this there would have to be a governance proposal uh for every single and a software upgrade for every single time you want to connect a new chain with a new uh with a new like set of logic or, or whatever mm -hmm. some other new innovation uh it's going to be crawling compared to agoric so it's <laughs> it's uh it was great relief to me to see that, that what you guys are doing with your chain is also going to be involved in the hub yeah well, so our code won't be won't be running on the hub, but obviously right. we'll be connected. So one of the things that is true about innovation is you want fast movers and slow movers, right? You're the sort of so the slow movement provides you some framework on which you're building the fast movement. Right? Scaffolding, and, right? You know, and there are limits to how slow you want, right? To me, it's sort of mind boggling that ERC seven twenty, uh, you know, or uh, um, uh, you know, sorry, ERC twenty took as long as it took to emerge on on Ethereum. That ERC seven twenty one is still eh, maybe kind of. You know, those are huge enablers of of framework that are yeah. You know, no system they're like a few methods, and we just need to agree on it. But a few methods, and we just need to agree on it, is also a little too fast. The ERC twenty world's a little too slow. What you want is something that 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 can move with with all deliberate speed but 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 not a little too chaotic so it is actually probably going to be good that the hub um, that, that, that the hub will be the an anchor point partly because it has some inertia and movement you can do an astonishing amount with just transfer provided by the hub not because the hub is providing uh, uh, key services, but but it's providing a stable place for me to go to to connect to to connect to some other zone. And you know, when we were thinking about, I've got my zone and I can connect to the hub. That sort of not very interesting. When I think about, I've got my zone and I can connect to all the services that connect to the hub. You know, now suddenly that's an explosion of opportunity there. That that I sort of get some arm's length buffering by you know by by the five billion dollars of momentum in the hub, right? Maybe yeah. six million dollars today. And you're not paying rent to do it either. You just I'm not paying rent to do. It. I mean, I'll pay some fees, okay, but those should be we I, we we all expect that the fees will be important but marginal um, yeah. from the point of view of the value delivered. And then with gravity, you know, you know, gravity and and you know and the fact that we don't actually need gravity, right? You know, so so gravity provides this bridge to Ethereum. You know, one of you know one of the, one of the things I characterize about all of this is you know 
we, like others, are launching a, a mainnet um, in, 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 you know, during the next year. Unlike two days ago, you know, we get to launch not in a vacuum. And in, there was this demo day in January of all these people demoing applications. The number of them that could that 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 could describe their value prop or what they succeed at as either relying on gravity, using gravity, or doing some other thing like that that would provide you know where their audience was an audience that was available over the over um, uh, IBC or via one of the multiple paths to the Ethereum audience was just enormous. I mean, that sort of suddenly, wow, there's a real pent up demand for this connectivity. And, and so, you know, we get to launch in this world of services um, uh, and, and back to that thing about a place to deploy. So now we don't have to start out as a place that has a lot of capital, though that's nice. That'll be nice to have a bunch of liquidity. You know, it's demonstrated that it's now straightforward to pull some of that, 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 that capital over from the existing, legacy place, which is Ethereum, right? You know, and pull that capital over, move it over to new economies on IBC or new applications on IBC in order to have them not be an island, but exist connected to, to, to you know, uh, I would say the mainland, but still all, you know, we're all still all, you know, DeFi as exciting as it is, is still relatively small compared to the, to, to the rest of the economy. So connect to the rest of that world. And now we've got you know, these shared pools of, of, of collateral that we can tap into these shared pools, pools of, of capital. So, it, so when I think of what the hub, what the hub does, or sorry, when I think of the Cosmos SDK, like mm -hmm. when you, when you think, okay, so when we have um, Kava, when we have Terra, we have all these, like, we call them like Cosmos based networks. Mm -hmm. uh, they all operate off of they were at least they originate with the Cosmos SDK. It's kind of this way to like easily launch a new chain with uh, an application specific chain or whatever. You can you can you can use this, this SDK as a means of it's almost they're like copies of the Cosmos Hub, but they've been <laughs> modified to work for whatever specific application. It means that they don't have to start from scratch to 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 have like a, a consensus mm -hmm. layer and all these other things that are really kind of dangerous mm -hmm. to tinker with. We've got this like battle tested way of right, having. Right. Um, of having of of running a new network, um, and it, and then we also have this promise now of being able to connect them all together. So when I but now when I think of Agoric, I think of it as being like another layer of being like now um, maybe I don't want to launch a new chain and, and and gather up a whole bunch of validators. I just want to launch my app my def my hot new DeFi application uh, mm -hmm. right out of the box and and fast and securely. You know, we mm -hmm. see all this rapid iteration on Ethereum, but it's it's not even a matter of if, but when these these contracts get drained. It's always this kind of like <laughs> game of of musical chairs where where everybody's seeking this like this yield, right, to get like uh, to to get in there quickly, get a whole bunch of money, and get the hell out before you lose all your money. Um, but what I'm seeing with 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 Agoric is. You know, the next hot new thing could just be launched the way that a new uh, a new Cosmos space network is launched, except you know, as a as as, as an app on as mm -hmm. a, on Agoric. So this is probably more of the focus than maybe trying to get uh, a hot, like relay transaction volume or whatever. Or, 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 <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I th I think that's well put. And you know, if, if you're a developer deciding where to build, a, as you say, a lot a lot of people building an application aren't going to want to deal with validators, aren't going to want to have to spin up their own blockchain. And so we want to provide a place where you can benefit from the security of our platform and also of Tendermint and, and knowing that that is going to function the way we all know it does, um, but, but still spin up your own uh, application without having to build a blockchain and, and bring in validators. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. The other thing that I think is, is important. So, you know, one of the characterizations we make about building smart contracts in, in our model is, you know, in Ethereum, in these other systems, you're pretty much sort of, you're, you're, you're almost starting from scratch. You know, every, every application is its new little, little silo, right? Now, obviously, as you say, Cosmos SDK, right. you can start a chain, not from scratch because you've got a bunch of the building blocks, but they aren't about your application. Yeah. Um, in, in our model of the world, and, and the way that systems that have exponential growth of developers have succeeded, you know, Ruby on Rails, NPM, React.js, Vue.js, all these things, is I get to use components that were built by other people to build my application. And more than that, 
I get to deploy into an environment that I can connect to those services. And so it's not just that I can, you know, so there's definitely folks where I'm going to build my application and I don't need anything novel in the consensus. So why am I standing up another zone? I might as well run on an existing zone that's already got that solved because I, I just don't need it. Right. You know, for, for my for my I'm, I'm selling magic axes. There's nothing you know that needs a new staking token for that. I just need to be able to take money and, and deliver you an NFT. Right. Um, but then there's the ones where where, you know, like like um, uh, uh, a couple of applic an example of uh, sommelier is is adding stop loss transactions for liquidity in 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 AMMs on 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 Ethereum. Right. In the Agoric AMM. Well, OK, you know. Oracles are a plug-in piece that I don't have to implement, right? You know, threshold, you know, logic is a plug-in piece I don't have to implement. So a few lines of JavaScript code, I can deploy a contract that, you know, get, grabs the Oracle, says when the price crosses here, then go to that contract where I have my liquidity and pull it back out, right? You know, extract my liquidity from that AMM. And so now I've got a the Legos. Right. Yeah, when we talk about exactly. DeFi Legos, um, you know, they're, they're a lot more rudimentary Legos with a lot more mortar in between when we think about Ethereum, I think, yeah, than, yeah. than if we think about what the future of Agoric is. Right. Yeah. They talk about Legos, but but they're the idea is they realized I can write a transaction that talks to multiple businesses in the same transaction. That's great. But that's but but the only way they've got of actually sharing work and building on, on each other's uh, work is copying the source code and munging it in, and you know, and they've had as many losses as they've had successes. The successes are huge, right? Uni incorporated the compound governance uh, contract or Uniswap into producing Uni, and that 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 got huge traction. But you know, DeForce did the same thing, and they lost twenty five million dollars. So you know, uh, do you feel lucky? You know, <laughs> right? um, and so that's one where I want not on uh, a vault mechanism that I'm, that I'm gonna copy code out of or a loan mechanism that I'm gonna copy code out of. What I want is to grab the plugin governance module that they used, NPM install, you know, contract governance two thirds, right? And now I've got this mechanism and I parameterize it with, here's my token that you're gonna use for governance. And I plug it in and say, here's the you know governable parameters, go. Right. And now I didn't I didn't have to be an expert at voting. I didn't have to worry about, you know, I just have to provide some parameters uh, in order to say how I wanted to use that component. It's already been battle tested. It's been security reviewed, all those kinds of things. And my new application that needs governance and would like to use some professional governance guidance can do so. Right? So I see this is like to a two sided market. Like I see uh, from the from the developer point of view, like I've got some great idea for an app. And but I would never do it because it's just such a it's it there be monsters like I I I have some semblance of responsibility and uh, and so I think to myself yeah this would be super cool and yeah like everyone would be into it but like I'm not gonna so called experiment in production so I'm just not I'm just not gonna do it because I you know and then I've got users like, as a DeFi user uh, I'm not a very active user my, like. The main reason I'm not an active user is because I'm a busy guy. I've got a lot of things to pay attention yeah. to, and I and I, and they're only so my mental shortcuts will only take me so far. So I'm like, did Trail of Bits audit this, or did some like unknown little guy audit this smart contract? And how much money am I actually willing to lose to to make you know 10% annualized or something? Right. So like. It means I just the end result is that I don't use a lot of new, especially new DeFi products, right. and um, I'm, I'm missing out. I, I really want to take advantage of those things. But what, so what I see here is, you know, a, a co contrasting with build it and they will come on the Ethereum side. Like I see this as being like unavoidably attractive to both sides of the market because. Uh, you know, if I've got like a s sweet new idea for an app and I want to go and I want to launch it fast because I really want to I want to get that market um, having the guarantees that come with with um, having having the components already built out of the box. I'm just going to piece them together in whatever novel com combination. Exactly. Give it a give it a name, some fruit or something or a food and launch it and people are going to flock to it. And because they're going to they're not going to have to. Oh, I don't know. They're going to say, oh, they're using. Agoric components, you know, we know that this is going to be solid, and why? And you know, after a bit of education and and a, and, and you know, what the way I see it is results comparing, like, oh, we haven't seen hacks here at all. 
right? We see all this new innovation, you know, and you get all the things that come with it, right? Cheap transaction fees, access to Ethereum markets, right? And and mm -hmm. and data. So mm -hmm. uh, I see it as being like this thing that's really needed. And as soon as it gets plugged in, there's kind of this osmosis. I think we'll see like value just transferred. Is this like is what is this as a vision? Does this like resonate with what you're trying to do? Oh, has, oh yes, <laughs> absolutely. And and this is the bridge to fintech developers, right? People that are not quite degenerate enough to launch a a DeFi project, but they, they see this, they understand, they can understand what an AMM does and why it's so revolutionary and want to come in and build something new. This is the way you reach those people. And I think in, in part also, we've talked about security from the aspect of you can import code and it's been battle tested already. Um, there, there's also a lot that Agoric is doing to make sure that as you're actually writing the code for the first time, you can reason more clearly about its security properties. And Dean, I, I don't know if you want to go into offer safety or anything like that, but um, yeah, that that's a big part of what we're building and, and what we're spending our time thinking about as well. Yeah. And, and if you want to go into it, try the, <laughs> whatever you can do for the, like I, I subscribe to the Richard Feynman approach. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. <laughs> that's right, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, I, I will first uh, 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 continue my example of the governance component because simply partitioning risk is a huge, huge win. So in the case of I grab someone's governance code and compile it into my application, now not only could that code help me with governance, it could take my private keys and send them to someone in a different country, right? Why it had access to my private keys, I don't know. It's because the frame or my, or my balances in my contract, it's because of the framework of, of most software infrastructures, including Ethereum, including um, Rust compiled to, to WASM, all those kinds of things. In, in, in our model of the world, you know, it comes in, it's got access to the governance thing. It could, you know, be buggy governance and 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 say yes when it was only 51% instead of two-thirds or you know 40% or whatever, or or you know, treat uh, Clayton's vote as 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 absolute so it could cheat on governance, but nothing <laughs> it can do can get to my balances. Nothing it can do can cause a transaction that steals my money. Nothing it can do can change, you know, the interest rate from what it is now to something other than the number we're voting on, right? And so that the, kind of partitioning is just a huge risk reduction. So at the surface, like this is these are this is may seem like really unsexy, but because it's like <laughs> for the average user, like uh, okay, what like? Yeah. But this is the thing is that we uh, the way that we operate in with all of these new contra with with these new smart contracts and applications is that we kind of are just like. Uh, okay, I'll put a whole bunch of money in. And other people do. Oh, I'll put some more money in there. Maybe it'll be okay, right? Maybe I'll get some insurance to help. But like uh, having things built well from the ground up, that means that uh, that things aren't going to touch other things that shouldn't be touched. I mean, this is why we this is why we use a, a ledger, right? Because um, you know, I shouldn't be. I shouldn't. I want to sign transactions easily. Um, to make quick trades and that sort of thing, but I shouldn't. But but that but what the thing that I use to sign those transactions shouldn't be accessible to anyone right. on the internet. Well, how do right. you do that? Well, right. you know the the private key never leaves this device ever, right. and right. and so like the, in in the same way, I, the, I guess that's what you're saying here that some things are sacred. They don't need to be touched. Right. They just need to get the information. Only the information that's needed. Right. Uh, this is like this is the promise of other things in, in in blockchain tech. Right. Where it's like, I don't, I shouldn't have to give up where I live and my phone number and all this stuff just so that I can uh, get a newsletter or something. Right. Yeah. yeah you yeah, just yeah. you just need my email address and you need some sort of guarantee that I'm I'm a real person or something. That, right? or that I actually of security is privilege uh, principle of least authority. Right. 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 Components, components and the question, the question is, you actually make isolated components, which we can and most people can. Components should only have the authority they need to get their job done and no more. And right. if you just do that sort of architecturally, if that's just the default of how things plug, plug together, now you dramatically reduce the overall vulnerability without even have to, having to worry about it. You know, it's just sort of, it sort of naturally falls out. Now, there will still be security vulnerabilities, but the key thing about these kinds of safety properties, and we talk about uh, this as a safety property and offer safety is another one, which I'll talk about in a moment. You know, when memory safety came out, it's not that the bugs moved around. 
right? It's that 80% of your bugs were simply off the table because you were using Java or C Sharp or JavaScript or Ruby or one of these things or Rust or what have you. Whereas in C, you have memory bugs and buffer overruns and all this kind of crap. Those just went away, right? And, and, and that's just a huge, huge win in terms of improving your overall safety without really having a, a big, you know, without impairing your ability to actually program. What it means is you could move more quickly because you can worry about, you don't have to worry about that class of problems. And that's exactly, right. and, and being able to grab components, I'm hearing background noise, by the way. Um, being able to grab components and plug them together means you get to move quickly because you didn't have to build those components. And that's, again, why, all the, why, you, why some infrastructures you see exponential growth of developers and some you don't. Yeah, yeah. And it, just to sum that up, I, I, from a user perspective, it, it's hard for us to construct examples for why it's, it's so important because they, they feel like toy examples. But from a developer's perspective, if you're deciding whether to bring external code into your contract, the question is, do I know for a fact that that code cannot possibly do something bad? And if you know for a fact that it can't, that's a much different thing than I think that it can't because I've read it and I, I you know, I, I believe that it won't. Um, and the difference between that level of surety is what allows things to grow quickly. And that, that's what will enable what we're trying to do. Yeah. So it's more, it's more sure-footed steps. People can move a lot quicker because the ground they're stepping on, they, can, they don't have to be constantly evaluating what, what they're building on. And uh, like, I just know the difference between when I use an, an interface, like when I use a, a well-made interface to send a transaction, versus whether I'm typing it into a command line, I'm like, did I put every little thing in? It's like, you know, if, if you have a good interface that's wet, like my crypto or whatever, that's like well made, I, I just know I'm gonna send this, it's gonna go where I need it to go. I don't need to think a lot about it. it means that I can do this in, in 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 thirty seconds instead of ten minutes, and yeah. uh, and it just burns. It uses a lot of less mental. I, char I characterize a lot of the user interface stuff in 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 current crypto. You know, and this now I'll, I'll talk about the offer offer safety thing. I characterize it as you know, send money to a random number and hope something good happens. Right. You know, I mean, you know, the, the, and it was funny is, is uh, we're working with Dan Finley of, of MetaMask and I got him to put together the slide that actually used his addresses where, you know, you go through, I want to send money to rent, you know, to, to, to Dan. And what I'm actually doing is send money to the zero X nine, four, three, something. Right. And then, then you go to Uniswap and you do the same thing. You know, I'm going to trade this token for that token. And it's this amount and it does the estimation and all the stuff. I push a button and the approval that comes up is, you know, send eight ETH to zero X A four seven. I don't know. Is that the right thing? And you know, we saw uh, who was it? The 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 guy that runs Nexus Mutual. You know, he got you know a bunch of random numbers. It's like, well, those look right. Those look right. Well, it turns out one of them was not right, but several of them were, and it's just totally unreasonable for him to you know for a human to be expected to to operate with. It's like using a spreadsheet where. You know, to name a cell, you have to use the hex address of the memory, you know, of the location in memory that that, that, that number is going to be at. It's just nuts, right? So our model of the world that then pervades all sort of elements of our, you know, well, everything above Tendermint, right? You know, the, the, the elements of how we build our framework. And then it also goes all the way out to the, to the UI and the wallets is I don't want to just send money. I want, you know, business is quid pro quo, right? I want to, I will give you this, I will give you this money if you give me that concert ticket, right? And so our contract framework is such that, again, instead of sending money to the contract and then it's going to decide what to do and maybe it'll give your money back, you know, or if it's an auction, maybe you're the winner, maybe you're the loser, but I'm going to keep your money anyway and a bug can steal your money. Instead, that money goes into the contract framework itself, right? You know, this thing we call Zoe. Um, so that now the contract knows, you know, there's cash on the barrel head sitting there available to you, Mr. Contract, if you provide the concert ticket to it, right? And now if there's an auction for this concert ticket, there might be a hundred bids, but the only way the contract, it knows how much is there, it knows what it can do, it knows all the bidders, or it knows rather, you know, what the offers are. The only thing it can do to get that money is give that concert ticket to one of those bids, one of those offers, right? And so... Um, and, and, and so a buggy auction could award it to the wrong party in exchange for less money than they could have gotten, but the infrastructure itself will prevent them from taking more money than the, than the, off, than, than the offer specified and will, will only let them take the money if they present the other side, if they present the want of that, of that offer. Right? So two counterparties can lean on, on the system itself as, as a, as a way of, of, of 
arbitrating that exchange exactly. so that you, you don't have to worry about what the, like as much about the smart contract that you're dealing with. You, right. you, you rely on the system, exactly. on the broader agoric system to right. do it. And, and, and the like, developer of the smart contract can rely on it too. As right, well exactly. Writing. Yep. Right, right, right. And and so, you know, like type safety, it doesn't solve all your problems, but it takes a, it makes a category of them non-issue. You know, we look at, at various exploits we see in Ethereum, and some of it was inspired by that exploit. That ought to be impossible, right? That, that that's that's not a human mistake. That's not a human. Right. You know, we, we you know, the problem with Ethereum is security experts have repeatedly rolled out contracts that seem like they're valuable, and they lose tens of millions of dollars in minutes with no recourse. These are smart people. If they can't get it right, there is no way you get millions of developers to get this right, right? And so it's so the, you, know, you look at these and go, that one shouldn't be possible. That one, okay, maybe that was dumb, right? But that one, those you know, those eight. That should just shouldn't have been possible. Like it and shouldn't so, even be possible at a system, like at a, exactly. at a design. You shouldn't be able to write code that could right. cause that bug without without really working at it, right? You know, right. So, I mean, the 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 I mean, several things like um, uh, um, uh, you know, it, like it takes your money and and some third party comes and drains it. Well, you know, it the contract shouldn't be in a position such that a bug would allow it to get rid of the money that you that it was obligated to only take if it gave you some other thing. Now, you know, there are plenty of things that that does not cover, like in the auction case, it could award to award the auction to the second highest bidder. And the second highest bidder gets a bargain because the second highest bidder will never have to pay more than they what what they bid. But but you know, and so the auction failed as being a good auctioneer, but it couldn't steal anybody's money for, you know, th that they weren't willing to provide, right? Right. And so like at the developer level, well, this probably makes sense to a lot of people who are familiar with this kind of development, but for anybody else that's not a developer, I think that what we're looking at here is um, the the a lot of the assumptions that we make and a lot of the trepidish, trepidatious stepping that we do when we use uh, existing DeFi applications. Um, I think like what I see as a future is, is, is that um, it'll be kind of it'll be almost dangerous or irresponsible to put your money where we're putting them now. It's kind of like the way people drove without seatbelts back in the day, because like, that's how it was done. Right. But, but, and, you know, people died and, and just, we accepted that. And, and, and then, you know, gradually it became unacceptable for people to fly through a windshield because, right. you know, it doesn't need to happen. It's a very simple uh, device. And so it, at first, at first glance, you think to yourself, like, Okay, developer speak, blah blah blah. But like, I think what we're hearing, what we should be hearing here, is that this is like DeFi. These are DeFi seatbelts that, that you can still drive your car as fast as you did before, as it, and it'll be as exciting as it ever was before. But a new kind of excitement, not will I fly through a windshield? Yes, right? I, I use the phrase, you know, DeFi as sort of the next frontier of finance. Like most frontiers, it's exciting but dangerous. We want it to be more exciting and still less dangerous, right? You know, so yeah. it's a little bit the analogy of seatbelts, but 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 let's go farther than that. And now we're talking racing harness, right? You know, I can drive a lot faster if I'm in a racing harness and have a roll cage, right? Yeah. You know, and and you know, and and so I can drive both faster and I'm safer. You know, yeah, and, like and yeah, there might be some effort the driver has to do to put on the racing harness, and you have to do a little more to build the, you know, but 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 that the roll cage was provided by the infrastructure. And so everyone gets to get, you know, so, so, so now we can all move more quickly. Right? Yeah, it's kind of like, uh, you know, people died in carriages, uh, like all the time. They're really dangerous. But like, I mean, looking back, it's like how exciting are carriage races really? And, uh, and, 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 and then the DeFi, like the DeFi creation space is like cornered by a few big players who are either willing to take huge risks don't sleep at night, uh, have tons of resources to be able to like build. So every, like they're kind of almost, it's almost like a cult of personality where people are like, oh, so-and-so is gonna make the next urine vault, vault or it's a super exciting or whatever. But like these things aren't like, like I mean, because the, the, the foundation and the, you know, the, the, the substrate that they're growing in is, is so, uh, is so hostile uh they're the only ones that can survive in this space right so right. it's kind of like oh it's amazing but like if the if this if the environment that they were growing these things in these products in was was like what we're talking about now you know uh you wouldn't need that you wouldn't need to be a polymath uh prodigy 
with with uh, no amygdala, right? <laughs> to to make this stuff and tons and tons of money. You know, you can see uh, way more innovation coming from a kid tinkering in in uh, you know a university kid tinkering or something, right? Rather than um, rather than uh, some of the titans that are in the DeFi space right now. Well, yeah, so, so absolutely yeah. university kids, you know, the, the, I mean, one of the reasons we love JavaScript, and it turns out, you know, in many ways, it's actually more securable than most programming languages, or pretty much all other programming languages. Total accident of history that that's true. Um, but but it is the is both the language usage itself, Node.js, which crossed you know a billion downloads last year, um, and and several of the libraries, they all had grassroots growth and explosion into dominance, right? Um, and um, uh, and and that's because it enabled lots of programmers to kind of just get it done, just do it themselves, you know, cobble stuff together, but easily build using components that other people built, right? That, that's a huge huge ingredient. But one of the things, you know, that I want to go back to, to something that, that, that Roland mentioned earlier, or actually you were talking about how, you know, you weren't ready to get into this, you know, 10% yield, whatever thing, because it was a little too, you know, strange and edgy. You couldn't figure out what's going on. I, you know, my previous uh, uh, job to, to running Agoric was building a, as it turns out, multi-billion dollar payment instrument as typical fintech. And one of the things that I observed in the world of fintech development is there's a lot of entrepreneurial developers, right? Every single person I talk to, you know, in, in, in everyone we hired in our company, um, everyone we talk to in companies we bridge to, all the evangelists in the, in, in the, you know, they were all very entrepreneurial. Often it was, what am I doing with my Saturday? If they didn't have a consulting gig, then they were designing some, you know, the next thing that they might want to do at their next startup. And it's not that they were all going to start companies. It's that they all had some service that they wanted to roll out or that they would work with someone to build and they'd carry it off and they'd go off and do the next thing. <clears throat> but, they, but they've got a lot of options. Right, I mean, not 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 stock options, but just a lot of opportunities <laughs> in different directions. I mean, they have stock options too, right? But and they've got a lot of energy, and they under they they they're gamified. They understand financial trade offs and financial technology. They understand financial opportunity, and they go in and look at blockchain, and they go, and they bounce because the 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 you know the the I can, of entry, right? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I can in JavaScript add an enhancement to the Bloomberg terminal to let me do another leverage kind of what's the who's it, right? And so, um, you know, why am I going to climb the cliff to learn this weird programming language that seems that doesn't really, you know, doesn't really have great development tools or debugging and tools? And you lose everyone's money, right? Yeah, it's, it's like you know, when when I have all these other opportunities, and it might actually be that blockchain would be a better opportunity, but. They've got you know eight hours on a Saturday when when the family happened to be off at an amusement park to really get something done, and they've got six opportunities in front of them, only one of which is blockchain. Right? So the the barrier to entry is 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 pretty high because of all their opportunities and because they've been just all over these opportunities. Being able to use existing development tools, standard development processes and practices, languages they already understand, connect to systems they already understand, you know, there's an untapped potential for people that really are financially motivated, entrepreneurial, think about new kinds of finance applications that, that you know, lowering that ramp means more of them will come across the bridge, you know, over, over into this space and they will bring new opportunities for existing DeFi investors, existing DeFi traders, new ability to go, oh, they're doing that. Oh yeah, isn't that cute? They didn't, you know, we did that 50 years ago. Here's the opportunity there. I'm going to take their lunch and then do it right you know, or, or what have you. And there's a lot of really smart people in DeFi, but some of them, you know, are getting away with things that don't work in the real world because other players know how to extract the value from them. And, and so there's going to be an interesting mix. And, you know, all of this will turn into much, all of this will will grow much faster and bridge to the mainstream markets and the mainstream capital pools uh, much faster if we, you know, if, if, if we've got more of those developers and able to be able to contribute. Yeah, and I, I think a lot of people that like we talk about barrier to entry, but uh, like the moat around certain languages as well is like JavaScript education is a billion dollar industry. And then like if you get out of that, then you're offered uh, a job at a very nice company getting top 10% salary at whatever country you live in. So it's like, yeah. what's the point of trying something new? It's like obviously pioneers won't 
give a shit. But then, you know, eventually you need this like new group of people to actually start building at capacity. Right. You can't tell me that there aren't people at Stripe, Robinhood, you know, JP Morgan, all those places that don't have some really useful ideas and strong connections into financial that once they're, you know, right now they got, they're making plenty of money. Right? Yeah. You know, there needs and, to be a reason to attract them. Right. And it's like, right. if they see, if they see every time there's a new cohort entering into this tech producing amazing products and every time a new amazing product is built, that makes it easier for you new users. We'll see more new users, and it's mm -hmm. kind of this interplay, right? I think this like uh, this. The, you know, we need users, we need developers, we need new products, we need new you know consumers, and so uh, every and, and this is like taking it to the next level every time, right? Like we we will build amazing, innovative new products, so that it's not just these like post apocalyptic coding warriors, <laughs> right? <laughs> Yeah. 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 We're going to have to steal a bunch of these phrases from you. This is, this I know, is I know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah, I mean, harnesses, I'm totally all over. <laughs> I mean, I think people don't really get that. They're just kind of like waiting with bated breath for the next, uh, the next product that's delivered by the existing few who are, who are bold enough to, uh, and, and, and outfitted enough to work in the space. Yep. But like, Let's face it, like there are people who want to build, who, who, like you said, have really great ideas, who are, who, uh, who are specialized, but so specialized that they don't really, I, I mean, I don't want to run blockchain infrastructure. I don't want to figure out how to know every nuance of like potential code problems. They just, they don't touch it from the outset. Right. And if you, and and then, so it's the same way you've got these application specific blockchains launching. Uh, we've got Terra. We've got uh, like other other uh, you know Akash and stuff where it, you don't you don't need to build it from scratch again. You can just focus on your amazing thing that you're building, right? And it's this, in the same way now. Instead of I don't need to rally up validators and and, and bootstrap an ecosystem, I can just plug in. Uh, so now you can have someone who's like like even more specialized, who's like really good at making like some some futuristic financial product that's gonna like turn crypto users on their heads, attract <laughs> all kinds of new users, right? And they're gonna build like amazing interfaces, user mm -hmm. interfaces, like instead of like kind of beating that dead horse of being like crypto is just so awful to interact with, uh, you know, uh, it, it's also developing in crypto is so awful. I think that the, this is Andre, the, the, the person who everybody <laughs> is kind of excited about, has written a number of articles saying about how nightmarish it is working in this right. space. Like this is a guy who's tenacious and, uh -huh. and clearly gifted. And even he's like one, like wonders, uh, sits in, and sits down and scratches his head and wonders what the hell he's doing. So, you know, if we can make that environment better, instead of just being like, developers need to make better UIs, like or right. UX is like, we need to make better platforms for developers to make. So it's right. easy to do that, right? And this is this is what I see here. Yeah. And the other thing, I, the other thing is is that the other kind of innovation that's really important and kind of underrated is a lot of innovation is incremental, right? You know, as I said that example of stop loss against against existing AMMs. That's an incremental enhancement that could really be valuable to a lot of people. You know, you know, if in order to roll out that enhancement, I need to stand up a whole new chain and a whole new interop infrastructure to Ethereum, that's a crazy amount of work for something that should be 20 lines of code, right? Um, and, and so by having these pluggable pieces, now more developers can contrib contribute where they've got an idea that is good and useful, but not enough of a differentiator to stand up a whole new business. Right, and so they can contribute. You know, the the I mean, uh, um, the uh, Sunny's chain coming out, which is an AMM, you know, workbench thing. Well, once you've got some cool idea, you know, okay, great. Now I've got an AMM. I would like to apply that into a few minor innovations in a vault architecture that leverages these innovations in an AMM, you know, and plugs them together. What does it take to do that little increment and this little increment over here so I can do automated liquidation or I have rate limited liquidation service. So all of those, you know, one person could do the rate limited liquidation service and now I plug that into my slightly improved, you know, vault mechanism that I just upgrade that facet of and now we've got things that instead of I have to, you know, 
innovate in AMM by slurping a bunch of liquidity out of the number one AMM. Instead, here's a new component. I'll make a little bit if you guys adopt it. And, you know, and now it can plug in and everyone benefits and, and we, we have less partitioning of liquidity and all those kinds of things. That, you know, incrementalism is powerful and very complementary to, to here's a brand new thing that you didn't used to be able to do yesterday. Um, and those work together well. And this is the Web3 vision. Like, this is what we expect. We don't expect everybody to hold, uh, you know, a thousand tokens and, and be checking in on every single thing. Like, it should just be, uh, you know, uh, the way the internet kind of works, right? But, right, but more right. and better, right? right. So and I don't want to go from, you know, a, 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 uh, a banking hegemony to a compound hegemony. I want right. multiple, you know, different services that 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 have to compete on an even footing, um, all you know, vying to provide me better, safer, faster enhancement of my money. Um, and you know, and and so um, you know, having innovation and having enough of an economy that multiple players are successful, instead of as you say, these you know, it's it, it's it's all dramatic entrances and exits. Um, uh, you know, that 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 that's that's where we'll be. I like both, right? I've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I like, you know, big explosive new things and I and I enjoy building them. I enjoy other people building them and explaining them and connecting to them and all that. But, you know, but but the economy has a spectrum of those things and our goal is, you know, more inclusive so that more people can cooperate in more ways. Um, you know, I want the cooperative world that that engenders and that means, you know, lots of routine boring things. If we can make those smart contracts and automate them, we still end up in a much better, safer world. Right? So you can fo focus on things that are like actually exciting that because you want them to be exciting, yeah. right? Um, so, so we talked a lot about like the what an Igor e like um, ecosystem looks like, but w like, maybe we could take a few minutes to talk about a little bit more about like what uh, about Igor itself. Like it's it's Igor's using the Cosmos SDK, um, you know, it's but it's clearly going to be different from from the Cosmos Hub. Um, you know, like what's w this is the AST token, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's the temporary the, name. Yes, the temporary okay. boring name. New names coming soon. Oh, ah, okay. <laughs> So okay, so Agoric token. What is what's an Agoric token doing? Why 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 do we have an Agoric token? I mean, we're, we're clearly there will be staking to secure the the, the network. It, how, is it, how is it different from what the hub's doing? So key thing that any chain uh, should answer. Key question it should answer is um, you know how does val any how does value accrue to the staking token? Right, and that's not because uh, uh, that's not um, because of profitability reasons or revenue reasons or making investors happy. Though that's always nice. It's that for a proof of stake chain, it better be the case that the value of your staking token grows with the economic act, the size of the economic activity that it's protecting. Right. Otherwise, you know, if I'm doing ten billion dollars of activity on a one billion dollar uh, uh, network, then you know, there's nine billion dollars worth of bribes I can use to buy up uh, control of the network in order to commit you know, various um, uh, 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 crimes against consensus, right? <laughs> and so um, and so, the key difference in architecture of the overall Agoric economy is that it's designed so that the, the, the value that flows to the staking token is not just did transactions happen or not just did messages get sent? Because that's sort of like charging for postage, right? And, you know, right. postage is important, but it's, you know, a very small fraction of my budget as a business. It's, it's operational um, costs, right? It's not right, the actual right. value that's value, being right. right. And so what we so what we do is 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 that the reward flows from the economic activity that that there is that there is DeFi integrated throughout all levels of the chain, right? So there's our platform, and then we build our platform to make these DeFi abstractions like a treasury, like an AMM, and so forth, and then we integrate them into into the overall architecture. And so the fees from Tra from trading in that AMM, the fees from minting the 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 local currency, the local stablecoin that you pay for execution, you pay for services, you pay for reservations of names, you pay for whatever, the 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 fees from that flow into the rewards to the validators. So the validators or to the stakers, right? So that the reward is proportional is you know the design is it's proportional to the economic activity, not proportional to how many messages you send. Okay, so I'm like I'm a if I'm an Agoric token holder, I and I'm gonna stake. I can expect to get um, a proportion of all of the economic activity that the that the Agoric 
ecos uh, from the eco aoric ecosystem. And the benefit, <laughs> of course, to the aoric ecosystem is that I get to launch my amazing new app really quickly with a lot of strong guarantees uh, on, on all fronts and innovate it quickly on it. And users get to use it comfortably. And then, you know, what you pay for that, that's going to anyone who's staking this token that that guarantees that all of this will work as expected. Exactly. And, 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 and I never use the word guarantees, but yes. Uh, well, and the, strong guarantees. Guarantee, yeah. you know, in blockchain, there better be the assets there to pay out any of these. Anything. Sorry. Um, but this is part uh, of that guarantee, glad. right? Part of the strength of the guarantee right. is because it's yeah. all being secured by economic capital. The, the, however, the, the, the strength of your guarantees is dependent on how valuable the, the asset is that's being staked. And so it's it's like intrinsic in here uh, that 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 it's 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 inherent that the value of this token needs to be capturing, and this yes. makes sense for yeah, yeah, like exactly. human behavior, but it also makes sense for 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 the logic of how the the, the system runs. Exactly, exactly. And right. the other thing that the applications that they're deploying gets, you know, to, is. Economies work, you know, local economies have a local currency so that when I go to the market, I can compare prices between multiple vendors. I can, I can, you know, the pricing of, of, of you know, going to the local mall and buying a, you know, option against some stock here and hedging it over there and buying insurance there, because that's what you do at the mall, right? Um, uh, you know, the, the, the ability to trade off the price of that insurance versus that, you know, Nexus mutual kind of thing versus hedging it over there or buying up, you know, I want to be able to compare those easily as opposed to every time I go, okay, so which currency do you take? Okay. And what's the exchange rate? Cause I know it's not quite one to one. So I'll do, you know, okay. You know, am I getting screwed here? Are you, you know, having a consistent, having an economy, a place where there are multiple businesses that can all interoperate with each other and present a consistent interface to the user and provide posted prices and all these things that we know reach the wheel of commerce. You know, that's one of the key elements. And so again, the, 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 these, ben these businesses benefit from, I can roll it out and not have to worry about, you know, which of the 16 currencies should I be taking? You know, it's like, no, convert them all local, you know, relatively low, uh, 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 you know, collateralization and fee to be able to do that, do your local transactions, you know, take your rewards back to Ethereum or Cosmos Hub or, or, or you know, Tardigrade or wherever it is you're taking your, your, your results to, right? And, and you know, but but the ability to have participated in the innovation that we were able to pile up on our chain, you know, is, can be available to people not just on our chain, but people elsewhere. So, so are you envisioning almost like a app store for work from like a user and user perspective? Um, so I can neither confirm. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, so the answer is, is twofold. One is um, not an app store in the permission sense. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, it is crucial from our, from sort of both philosophically and, and from our perspective, uh, architecturally and, you know, and regulatory, you know, from a regulator, Point of view. Yeah, so, outside yeah. all of the negative aspects of like central <laughs> store, obviously. So, so definitely, you know, definitely that kind of thing. Uh, um, uh, I, you could imagine being a value. It's, you know, what are the entry points for new people coming to the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. People that already know their way around. They don't. They don't need that, right? You know, the, and 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 so um, so some of so part of the idea there is is you would like there to be able to be multiple sources of curation and people can opt into whichever one they, they, they find valuable, but obviously there'll be some default set of curations as you come in as a new user that gets you a start. And, okay. and there will be the components that are part of our, our core protocol, which obviously are sort of privileged in certain ways, um, but also include code that people can reuse in their own applications, right? So if you have a different vault kind of thing you wanna do, if you have a different AMM kind of thing you wanna do, We'll have examples that you can launch. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you want, to, if you don't want to bother with governance, and you just want to use the same governance module that we use for actually voting on chain governance, you know, install that plugin, connect it to your token, and you're off to the races. Right? Doesn't mm -hmm. mean you get to control the governance of the chain because you know that's 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 a separate <laughs> that has separate authority, right? But you can reuse the components. Yeah. Uh, just being well, mindful of time here. Yeah, we're at an hour. Um, do y'all still want to keep talking or should we start? <laughs> <laughs> we, 
we did, you know, next, you know, we should do it again. We should talk a little bit more. Uh, something we didn't even touch on, NFTs. I know that you've got some probably <laughs> exciting stuff to talk about there. I mean, DeFi is super hot, but like NF NFTs are really coming up. And I know that you've got some some really cool ideas there. So yes. maybe we could we could like continue this conversation. Uh, I would love to continue this conversation. That'd be great. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've heard you doing schedule another one or would you like to continue now uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, we can we can continue right now you want to continue sure we can talk what's so, well, yeah what's on the menu for for nfts oh, okay. so, Colin, how are you doing for time <laughs> oh I, no i'm good no, okay, I, have cool. the, I have the same meeting now that dean does so uh, we'll both <laughs> <laughs> and your whole team's in the channel so they they're they're probably yeah, really well. so good, yeah okay, cool. I, I bet there's some that are in off coding you know just like <laughs> i've heard <laughs> dean <laughs> it's a growing team um, so yeah, so what's on the menu for, for NFTs? Well, okay. So, so I, and I should, I should preface for anyone who doesn't know an NFT non-fungible token. The idea is that like ether or like, uh, you know, uh, atom or whatever asset you know, they're all exactly the same. So like if, if I have a, an atom or you have an atom, like it, do, it doesn't really matter where that atom originated. There are no special properties. No NFTs are, are. Uh, tokens that are very uh, that are unique, so n none of them are the same. It's like you know your house is 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 not the same as the house next door. So you wouldn't just say uh, well, I don't care which house I have. This is the same right. way, same kind of thing, right? Okay, so so and, and just I, I only have a few minutes here, um, so I'm just going to tease you on NFTs, and we should we should really plan to continue uh, another time. Okay. Um, uh, uh, so. In our, you know, we have example dApps in our system as part of the development. It's all open source. People can grab it. Um, you know, come to GitHub Agoric and and get it. Um, there are NFT examples. You know, uh, Kate Sills, one of the, you know our, our our main developer on the contract framework. Um, she, uh, uh, you know, she built an NFT application in a day. We're creating an NFT, a new NFT. You know, it's just one more line of JavaScript code. I, I want to be able to mint new tokens. I want to mint new tokens that are all distinct from each other. They have the following structure. We're off to the races. And so building NFTs is really easy in this framework. The overall protocol for being able to do trading and exchange, all of Zoe, it equally applies to NFTs. And 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 I think we should we should we should probably leave that as sort of a starting point for our next round of conversation. Um, uh, and, and, um, you know, since our, 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 you know, really is heads down on development of getting this stuff done, you know, getting, getting back to the engineering team that, that they're starting to, uh, uh get answer here. Um, uh, I, I probably, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, thank you for say, taking this time out for us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Let, let's, let's definitely schedule another one. Um, and like, maybe we can have an AMA in our telegram channel for more like specific need to know information when, uh, mainnet approaches for. Uh, Agoric token holders, not AST. I think there's yeah. a, an incentivized testnet test net coming up. Uh, there's a lot, a lot to be excited about. So start to like play with a, lo a lot of the stuff. If you're a developer, you know, if you're a staking service provider, um, a hobbyist, uh, there's a lot to to kind of take in here. And I, you know, I'm personally really excited about this uh, this protocol launch, and uh, I, I really see it as like a like see the long kind of the long vision here. Uh, I know we're in like a boom cycle right now, so you know everything is is worth uh, paying attention to. But uh, I really, I'm I'm looking forward to seeing um, Agor take us to the next level beyond like uh, beyond uh, just you know bull bull market excitement. <laughs> we we have to we have to tell Gavin every now and then in meetings we have to go like we get it you like Agor. <laughs> <laughs> All right, but, but yeah, definitely, definitely. I, we are super excited about the project and uh, we look forward to, to talking again, but we'll stop Great. wasting the time now. Yep. Thank you guys so much and, and I look forward to talking to you guys soon. Yeah, same. Thanks, guys. Bye, Dean. Bye, Clay.